remain effective. But how could it be otherwise? Well, the circulating water will likely contain air bubbles, which may be released at the top of the water box, forming a large air pocket. In time, as the air pocket increases, the level of the water at the top of the water box falls, and consequently, there will be no water flow through some of the tubes. The result of this reduction in heat exchange will be that the condenser is less effective and the turbine back pressure increases. The siphon connection prevents this from happening by drawing off the air at the top of the water box and piping this into a vacuum tank. The vacuum in the tank is maintained at about 25 inches of mercury by small vacuum pumps that are intermittently operated. A water level sensor in the water box operates a control valve on the siphon connection. When the level falls below a set level, the valve opens and air is drawn out, allowing the water level to rise. When the level raises to fill the water box, the control valve closes. The problem of air accumulation may also occur inside the steam space of the condenser. Remember that this area operates under a negative pressure, a vacuum. Therefore, any leakage by valves, piping, or flanges will allow air to leak into the steam space of the condenser instead of steam leaking out. Also, some incondensable gases, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, may be released from the steam as it condenses. There is a tendency for these gases, plus any small amount of leakage air, to accumulate inside the steam space and eventually cause the back pressure to rise, reducing turbine efficiency. In order to remove air and gases from the steam space, vacuum devices are fitted, such as a steam ejector and a vacuum pump. This air removal equipment is connected to a specific location in the condenser known as the air box. In this area, additional cooling tubes are concentrated to ensure that the steam condenses and only air and gases are removed. In many plants, the discharge from the vacuum equipment is monitored to provide a measure of air leakage into the condenser. During normal operation, this air leakage should be quite small. In fact, a good test of this during operation is to shut down the vacuum pump or steam ejector and observe the rate at which the back pressure increases. This should be quite slow, say one inch of mercury in about 30 minutes. Compare this with the change which would take place if all of the circulating water flow were to cease perhaps due to a trip of the circulating water pumps. In this case, with no condensing taking place at all, the back pressure would rise immediately and the turbine would have to be tripped. In practice, this takes place automatically. And we'll be discussing this when we look at protection devices in the next module. So we can see that during normal operation, the vacuum equipment is intended to maintain the vacuum in the condenser, not to create it. However, we also depend upon the vacuum equipment to draw a vacuum before startup. In this situation, before steam is admitted to the turbine, the condenser and the turbine are full of air. In order to remove this air, the vacuum pump or steam ejector must be placed in service and so pull a vacuum inside the unit. Let's see how the steam ejector works. This functions on the principle of the Venturi nozzle like this. When high velocity steam passes through this nozzle, it creates a vacuum at this convergent point. This is the point which is connected to the air box in the condenser. The air enters the nozzle and is mixed with the steam passing through. On a startup ejector, also known as a hogging ejector, this mixture is discharged to atmosphere. However, the requirement for air removal when the turbine is in service is much less. Therefore, the on-load ejector uses smaller nozzles and has some heat and steam recovery. As before, air is drawn from the condenser by the primary ejector, and the air and steam mixture discharges into a heat exchanger to condense the steam. 
The cooling medium is usually condensate, so all of the heat is retained within the cycle from the intercooler. The air is now drawn into a second stage ejector, which is at quite low pressure, that is a modest vacuum. From here, the air and a small amount of steam is exhausted to atmosphere. The creation and maintenance of vacuum in the condenser is an exceedingly important part of turbine operation. And we'll be looking at this in more detail in the next module in this series, when we focus our attention on turbine operation and control. Make sure that you learn all of the features of the condenser and vacuum equipment, which is installed in your plant. Okay, <clears throat> so we're finished that one, and uh, I didn't record all. I didn't record all of that, um, but I will send the link, and so uh, you'll have that available. They're easy to find. Uh, we may watch one more of these. I don't know. I'll take a look at it and see. But this guy, uh, he's really quite good. These uh, these are very detailed and. Uh, I mean, this shows you what goes on in, in the power plant for sure. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's go to, we need to finish. Hopefully we can get finished this uh, turbine article today. That's my intent. Let me see. If I... Something. why this is down here. Oh, well, who knows? I guess it doesn't hurt anything. Okay, so um, we're gonna jump in here. Let's see what page, if you're following along, this is page 12. So, um, so as far as load changing procedures, um, let's go down and look at these charts. I think it's uh, figure 13 has uh, a number of different curves on it. Two, 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 seven, two, nine, ten. Uh, that's the hybrid. That's where we finished up last time. Okay. So these days, I'm sure this is all computerized and should be, but you know, nonetheless, we need to see what's going on on it. Uh, notice this is for a 2400 PSIG, 1000 degree main steam, 1,000 degree reheat steam turbine design for 37.5% minimum uh, arc admission control. So that's the spec on the unit. Let me see, go up one more clicker to, yeah, load changing recommendations. Okay, so the way this works is um, there is an equivalent first stage steam temperature given your throttle steam conditions. And there's a couple of examples on here, whatever. Um, and so this is, you know, these are hundreds. So this is 1500 pound steam and they're showing this is 800 degree Fahrenheit, okay? So what this does, so this takes into consideration, basically it's a, a enthalpy determination. But um, so based on the, the uh, temperature and pressure you come over, and um, once you hit your pressure, your temperature, you come across. Okay, and then you have a series of curves over here, depending on the type of valve program that you're running. So the really dark curves are for single valve throttling type control, where all the valves work together and are at the same position. The sequential valve would be in this case, 37% minimum mark. And then as you go up in, in uh, steam production, you would, or load, you would open more and more valves. And so this lets you determine a first stage exit steam temperature, okay? And so if you're, say you're gonna do a load change, well, you may be some combination of steam temperature and pressure, and you may be at 100%. Well, at 100%, then you can read uh, your first stage steam temperature. You can also look and see what your uh, indicators, uh, the actual temperature gauges that, that, that you have, um, the first stage inner, well, inner surface metal temperature, they call it. Um, and then, so you have a destination where you're gonna go. Maybe they say you're at 100%, we want you to go to 50% load. 
okay, well, if you uh, anticipate those steam conditions being the same, or you could enter at different steam conditions, you know, based on experience, but let's say the steam conditions are gonna stay the same and we're going to 50%. Well, okay, so if we're 50% and we're gonna do this with um, single valve control, then we would stop on this line and read down. And so then that first stage temperature is gonna be 700 degrees. Well, you may be at 850 now, so that gives you the temperature change that that rotor is gonna see, okay? And so you use this, these two curves to figure out, well, okay, how big is the temperature change at the uh, first stage of the turbine gonna be? And then you come down here and you have your uh, fatigue index curves, okay? So for example, uh, well, here, this is pretty clear. Let's say that temperature change is gonna be 250 degrees, okay? So then you would come in at 250 degrees and you would come across to whichever um, fatigue index curve for cycles to the development of a detectable crack that your uh, management had told you to operate by. So, I mean, this is a management decision. So that 10,000 means 10,000 symmetrical stress cycles up and down uh, before the, the uh, observance of a detectable crack. So that's the fatigue life of the rotor per se. Okay, well, so at 250, if we came in and say, if we were operating on the 10,000 curve, we would come over here and that lines up pretty good and come down. And so that says 80 minutes. So that means I need to make this change over an 80 minute time span in order to limit the damage on the rotor to the equivalent of 10,000 cycles before I get a detectable crack, okay? And so now you won't see these curves today, but this is the same stuff that's programmed into the control systems. So this is what, this is the thought process that's gone through, yeah. No, it's cooling it down as well. Okay. But the assumption is that um, one cycle is a complete alternating stress cycle from tension, steady state to compression or compression, steady state to tension, whichever way you're heating or cooling. And so, you know, now the reality of it is that um, these changes in operating scenarios don't come in all symmetric cycles. You know, this says, okay, you're at hundred percent, go to 50. And then they say, you know, you sit there for a while and this is now, okay, go to, go to 30, goes back now, go to 70 and all that sort of thing. So how you count stress cycles is really very interesting. Say my, my dissertation on my PhD was to write software to actually run online with the turbines. And so, you know, we would monitor these temperature changes and then try to calculate damage. Well, you get all of these different points up, down, up, down, you know, but they're not symmetrical stress cycles. So somehow you have to do your best to turn those into symmetrical stress cycles. So there's different techniques. The one that I used was called rainbow um, cycle counting. And it's some, some, um, algorithm where you plot all of these temperatures up and then you that that you plot them in terms of time and then you rearrange them to try to make symmetrical cycles out of them and so it's like you might monitor that for a day 24 hours and then you would go through the cycle counting and try to match those together and then you do the damage calculation it's pretty interesting but so it's, it's easy to talk about, it's a little bit harder to program, you know, if you actually have to come up with the algorithms to do it. But that's kind of the theory behind it. Okay, let's go back up to that. There's some good text for this. Uh, uh, yeah, here we go.
Okay, so then let's see. Um, a lot of good information here. So, you know, operating charts generally provided to help, help the operator determine the length of time uh, to change load or the load changing rate, however you want to say it. Uh, changes at lower loads are generally accompanied by changes in inlet uh, steam pressure and temperature, both of which affect first stage temperature. We saw that curve. Uh, and because of the variability of boiler characteristics, you know, the, the turbine guys can't just operate or can't write one operating procedure because boiler characteristics vary all over the place. And so this is something that has to be kind of worked out once you understand the characteristics of your boiler, how much boiler droop do you have as you change steam production rates? How much does that temperature change? Do you have sliding pressure controls? All that sort of thing. Um, so let's see, to select load changing rates consistent with 10,000 cycle fatigue index recommendation or other selected cyclic life, the influence of inlet steam uh, conditions on first stage temperature must be considered. And that's what that first figure did. And then we see the influence with the second figure down there on uh, 13 uh, of the valve program, what we're doing. Hmm. Let's see. And there's a lot of discussion about the differences. Uh, if we're doing sequential valve, we get bigger temperature swings. Uh, if you're doing uh, throttling, single valve throttling, then you don't have as much temperature variation. And the other thing that they note in here is if you have both capabilities, let's say you're operating single valve and all of a sudden you switch, you punch a button and you switch to sequential valve, you get an instantaneous change in that first stage steam temperature as predicted by those curves, which is kind of, which is kind of an interesting point. So let's, uh, let's go back down here and look at that. That's pretty interesting. So let's say you're, um, oh, let's go over here. Let's say you're 50%. So just go on this line. Well, if you're 50% and you were on single valve mode and all of a sudden, you jumped to uh, sequential valve mode, your first stage temp steam temperature would jump from 700 down to uh, about 630 instantly, just by punching the, because all of a sudden you reposition the valves, you change the amount of throttling and you'll change your steam temperature based on that. Very interesting. So, you know, something that I guess you got to be careful with. I mean, you don't really want to put an instantaneous. Thing. Now, unless the steam was too hot and you looked at it and said, oh, that's way too hot. So you go to sequential valve and all of a sudden your steam gets colder and you match your rotor better. Okay, then that was probably a good idea. But anyway, so all of these effects are at play. Okay, so that's where he's talking about this uh, valve stuff. Okay, family of curves. That's where he's talking about the uh, fatigue index curves on three. We already kind of talked about that. Uh, for example, he says uh, a change of 250 degrees F in one hour falls almost on the 5,000 cycle line and therefore accounts for one over 5,000 of the fatigue percent of the total fatigue capacity of the rotor. So say one over 5,000 is 0.02%. And so that's how much you eat up of your fatigue life by that one symmetrical cycle. So he says, uh, you know, a hundred, say if you do that often, let's say you do that a hundred times a year, 100 times 0.02 is 2%. So just that one load change done over and over again, um, 100 times, well, 
over say the course of one year, you've eaten up 2% of your fatigue capacity. Now, and you've got a lot of other stuff going on too. So you might have some worse stress cycles than that occasionally. Uh, okay, so here's where they talk about the, how you define the cycles. The cycle consists of uh, both a heating phase and cooling phase. Thus, on the 10,000 cycle line represents 10,000 times the turbine first stage is heated as load is increased, held at steady load until temperature equalization occurs between the surface and the bore, and then cooled at the same rate back down. So it's, that's how those uh, fatigue index curves are generated. But like I said, I mean, that's, life doesn't, Life in the power plant doesn't really work like that, but nonetheless, that's how they develop the index curves. Mm. Yeah, here he's talking about the, if you change valve programs that you'll instantly change, first stage steam temperature will immediately increase or decrease depending on which direction you're changing, so. We've already kind of been over that. 14 is nuclear. I don't know anything about nuclear. <laughs> I'll go skip it. Okay, shutdown. Some interesting stuff here. You know, what we're looking at, you know, I, I mean, I kind of view this as I want you to learn, you know, kind of the ins and outs of, of thinking about steam turbines and how they operate and how they're put together. And then the other part of it is how can we screw, how can we screw these things up? You know, what can they do in the plant that can, you know, seriously damage the uh, uh, the rotor. So, you know, he's talking about shutdowns. Well, except in an emergency, load should be removed at a rate determined from the load changing charts, which we've been looking at. If it's desirable, but 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 you do have some different uh, uh, leeway in your operations, depending on you know what's going to happen next. You know, when you go to shut the thing down, it's nice to know. Is it going to come back up in six hours? Is it going to come back up after the weekend? Or is it going to be down for two months for maintenance? That affects how you shut down the, uh, the turbine. So if it's desirable to keep the turbine in a heated condition ready for hot or warm restarts, certain actions will be taken during unloading uh, that will help the situation. If the unit has sliding pressure, remember that, that, that temperature, the sliding pressure control, that temperature actually goes up a little bit as the load goes down. And so if you wanna keep it hot and you have sliding pressure, you would want to get the valves open and then reduce pressure on the boiler to reduce steam flow and bring it down that way. And that would leave the rotor in a much hotter condition. Okay, yeah, so sliding pressure, blah, 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 temperature first stage. Uh, if the unit's governor valves can be placed in single mode um, control before reducing loads, the first stage will remain higher at low load compared to sequential valve because sequential valve had the biggest temperature decline as we came down in steam production. It was the one on the bottom, the sliding pressures on the top and the single valves in the middle. So if you're only operating with single valve or sequential valve and don't have sliding pressure, then the single valve is gonna leave a hotter rotor than if you come down with sequential pressure. And then, so you look and say, well, okay, what's, you know, what's the schedule for this thing? Now, sometimes you don't know, but you know, good dispatchers would let you know, yeah, we're anticipating this guy coming back on in you know, 10 hours. Okay, well, we wanna leave it hot. Okay. Um, tripping the unit from high load will also keep the unit at high temperatures as steam flow is abruptly stopped and the insulated unit cools at a slow rate. Well, I've never been in a plant where you had a unit trip. And so when it trips, the stop valve shuts, bam, and the steam is routed through the roof. You throw it away because you got no place to put it because a trip means we got to shut this thing down now. 
So the stop valve closed, there's no more steam through the turbine and the steam automatically goes through the relief valves through the roof. They say it sounds like you're about to get run over by a freight train. I've never heard it, but they say the first time, the first time you're in a plant and there's a trip, you know, you're probably gonna have to go home and change, change pants <laughs> because it's pretty exciting. I kind of hope I, you know, I'm probably only going back one more time to Kingston. So I, I wouldn't mind hearing a trip, you know, I don't know about, about you guys, but anyway, they say it's quite exciting. But it's not something that you just want to do. You do it from an emergency situation. You don't do it as standard operating procedure. Uh, let's see, during the shutdown, uh, let's see, gland, the uh, turbine gland ceiling steam and condenser vacuum. We just saw all about that. Should be maintained and all that sort of thing. Okay. To purposely cool down the unit uh, during the unloading period in preparation for maintenance or some cases better temperature matching. Um, Let's see, some activities, these include uh, full throttle pressure during unloading, keeping governor valves in sequential mode, because that's gonna produce the lowest temperature steam and lowering load to recommended minimum load before tripping the turbine offline. Okay, so we just wanna get a feel for that. What are some of the strategies that we could use to adjust the temperature at which we're going to leave that rotor after a shutdown. Okay, abnormal, or as in Young Frankenstein, the movie, it was Abby Normal operating conditions. But you guys are so young. Has anybody seen Young Frankenstein, the movie? It's a great movie. It's an old classic. By Mel Brooks? Yes. Yeah, yes. I've seen it. Was it Igor? Was it Marty? I think it was Igor. Yeah, Marty Feldman. It, it was a humpback, but the, the, the side of his back, the hump was on, kept changing from one scene to the other. He'd be humped over on the left and then be humped over on the right. And uh, You guys got to see young Frankenstein or Frankenstein. If you haven't, get on uh, YouTube or something and watch it. You'll love it. It's classic. Okay, so turbine generator unit may be subjected to uh, various operating conditions, which may eventually result in shortening the unit's life. In other words, man, can we screw it up here? Uh, some of these conditions are low load operation, operation with feed water heaters out of service, and water induction. Okay, so two types of low load operation may be experienced. Minimum online, and auxiliary load. Okay, so online means that we are synchronized, which means you are connected to the grid, okay? You know, uh, auxiliary load is station load. And so you can produce the power that's used in the station and not be connected to the grid. Okay, that's what they mean by auxiliary load operation because you know, they've got, they've got huge feed water pumps, they got huge fans, they got electrical load all over the place, okay? And so, you know, these guys, they make electricity, you know, so they make their own electricity. So auxiliary load, sometimes they call it auxiliary station load, but this guy is such a power plant professional that he doesn't even put station in there, he expects you to know that. But that's what auxiliary load is. Minimum online operation generally occurs uh, at the initial application of load following synchronization. So we're bringing the unit up, we get it up to right speed, we synchronize it, which means we have tied it to the grid, and then we're gonna operate at this low load to let everything warm up, because maybe we're coming up at, you know, maybe this is a cold start, okay. Uh, so coming up after synchronization or after the reduction or shedding of load prior to shutting the unit down. So it's usually during a transient. Recommended minimum load such as 5% rated load are generally specified by turbine manufacturers to provide for safe operation. 
which is good. We like safe operation. Okay. If you operate at loads below these limits, you can potentially overheat the low pressure turbine exhaust end blade path, which could lead to blade damage, rubs, differential expansion ro between rotating the stationary parts, distortion, all kinds of things. So what happens, these temperatures, when you get low enough load, your steam flow is so low that you just lose the aerodynamics at the low pressure end, these big blades. And all of a sudden, the steam doesn't flow, you know, as it should through the stationary, you know, the diaphragms and then the rotating blade and the diaphragms rotating. Blade. So the last umpteen stages, instead of the steam doing work on the turbine blades, where the turbine takes out energy, the rest of the turbine is turning those blades and they are churning the steam because you've lost your aerodynamics. <clears throat> and when you do that, you can generate extremely high temperatures extremely fast. So that's what we're saying down here in the last, last part of this. High temperatures are generated when the steam is not doing work on the exhaust end blading, but the blades are in effect doing work on the steam. So it's a combination of low steam flow through the blades, uh, high exhaust or condenser pressure, high inlet steam temperature uh, resulting from high reheat temperatures because your steam flow is so low. Uh, and if this happens, I mean, it's hard to think that you can generate that high a temperature that fast, but it's localized heating and some of those blades will get so hot, they'll grow. The expansion will be enough to cause a rub, either with a stationary blade or the outside of the casing or something. And, you know, you can, you can wreck it pretty quick. You start getting metal rubs in your turbine, you got a big problem. Okay, so that's what that's talking about. Another consideration when operating the unit online at very low load is the possibility uh, that system swings might cause the turbine control valves to close in error. You get a glitch in the control system because you're operating way down on the ragged edge of the low end. And so if something happens, you get a glitch in the turbine um, controls and it, it closes the steam valve. But you're, if you're, but you're synchronized and on the grid. Well, if you're synchronized tied to the grid and you're not putting steam through the turbine, then that generator turns into a motor because a generator and a motor are the same thing. You know, if you take an electric motor and you spin the shaft, you get electricity out of the wires, okay? If you take, you put electricity in the wires, then the shaft spins. So the idea of the turbine is the turbine provides the torque that turns the shaft and the electricity comes out of the generator and goes out on the grid and we sell it. That's good. But if that turbine is synchronized, if that generator is synchronized to the grid and that turbine control valve shuts, you're not pushing. There's nothing pushing. And that generator instantly becomes a motor uh, and it turns all of the turbine blades, which has, which has steam inside the casing. And then we generate all of these very high temperatures again throughout the entire length of the turbines, high pressure, IP and LP. They all start churning. And so that's called motoring. And we can't, you can't allow motoring to occur. So motoring occurs when the generator acts as a synchronous motor and drives the turbine. Should this occur, there's danger of overheating the LP blading as discussed above and possibly an inadvertent trip by action of the anti-motoring protective equipment. So if that should happen, that should generate an automatic trip. And that would be an electrical trip of the generator from the grid. You gotta get off of the grid because you're pulling power from other units to turn, make that thing turn. Uh, the other condition of low load operation is that of carrying uh, auxiliary load following the separation of a unit 
uh, from the system load. So, so we have cut ourselves loose from the grid and we've been online. So we've got a hot rotor, we got everything's warmed up. And then we drop down to auxiliary load. Uh, in this case, motoring cannot occur because you're not tied to the grid, uh, but the same concerns about overheating the LP blading still exist. So you gotta be careful with that. I'll tell you what, I think I'm gonna go ahead and quit here. I thought I could get all this done today, but uh, uh, haven't done it. Uh, I'll post this and uh, we will absolutely finish this little article. We don't have much more to talk about. And uh, so we will carry on uh, next time, next week. Um, I will probably tell you to start reading another one of those chapters. We may go a little bit slow. We've got at least, we've got two or three more to read before we get through the, uh, the end of the semester. But I'll give you the weekend off on that. <laughs> okay, everybody have a great weekend. Let me know if you're going to Kingston on, the, on uh, April 8th, one way or the other. And uh, we'll, we'll be back uh, next week. Take care.